Hello, everyone. Because this is a Linux Foundation event, so I thought I should do something fun and go through all the GitHub repos on Java AI that I could find. It turned out to be an impossible task. So when I just went to GitHub and enter LM, I immediately found like 26,000 results. And then I was like, okay, let's try GPT. And it's even worse, like 100,000 results on GPT. So I had to narrow it down. So in, in the end, I decided to go search for a repo with at least 500 stores. And I ended up with 800 repos. For those who are curious, uh, so these are the, some of the GitHub accounts where I can find the most number of repos on my list. So um, this is not, of course, they are like very uh, regular suspect, as the, as the usual suspect by OpenAI Microsoft. And this is not a comprehensive list, I feel like. If I keep on like searching, I probably can find more. But at some point, like you have to stop with those like, obsessions. Um, so um, now I have data. And the next thing I thought about is like, okay, now how do I run some analysis? And the first thing I thought I should do is to try to categorize these repos. And they thought, okay, how, how should I go about it? And they talked to a bunch of people. And in the end, we said to break it down into like different layers of the stack. So at the, top, at the highest, at the top layer, then we have a lot of applications, right? First of all, like chatbot, image uh, editing, and all of these like really cool applications you can use on the phone, or on desktop, or on the browser. And then just below it are, is the, we call the like, applications development layer. So we call it like AI engineering, when you would develop the applications for end users. And just below it, as a model development, is when you actually create output models, something like Llama or like other Mistral. And of course, there's always infrastructure. That's where everything happens. Like, so for most of the layers, you don't really have to know a lot about machine learning. So, but it's one layer is model development when you actually deal with the model weights and change, um, change model. But the rest of the layers, you don't really change model weights. So for the infrastructure, so um, some of the categories are like compute management, right? For example, like Skype pilot or like Hicksville or like Ray or like inference server monitoring. For more development, you have something like modeling and fine tuning. And this is where there are a lot of exciting things happening. And also like there's an inference optimizations uh, like GGML, TensorRT or Trident. And as AI engineering level, you can see like um, AI engineering framework like Langchain, GPT-4 or Llama Index. And then we will have a lot more of those as we go through the process. Oh, I think this is the older slide. Um, but so when we, get to, uh, when we try to like categorize, break down like which number of um, repos, then we see that like most of the number of repos we found are in the AI engineering and more development. But what has really surprised me is like the number of open source applications out there. Like it's very easy to go like whatever you want to do, you can probably find a GitHub repo with exact would, could meet would meet the exact need in a totally open source. If we can break down more further into my like subcategory, and I just thought I would go into like detail like uh, what some of these subcategories are doing. So one thing that no that uh, really jump out to me is like the number of repos that related to like inference, so like inference optimizations and inference server. So these two categories are very closely, closely related because they both solve for late latency and cost. So like if you want to like solve the latency for the end users, you can either do it as a model level, as a model level. Like you might want to quantize a model, make it smaller, faster, or you can try the new exciting techniques like faster decoder. For example, like uh, Medusa is a is a framework that allows you to like use multiple decoders so that you can do faster inference, uh, faster text uh, token generations, or you can use something like look ahead decoding. Whereas the inference server is you deal more with something more like dynamic or sequential or continuous batching or some newer techniques. For example, like you might try to like host multiple LoRa's adapters concurrently. I can do something like packaging and loading of models. So I think a lot of the tools in either this category might also try to do the other because it's solved for the same problem. Another category that I find interesting is prompt engineering. So when I talk to my friends that like, if I, uh, so I actually recently went through like a list of like use uh, case studies of my like 22 
enterprise sort of AI use cases. And something that's like a lot of these case studies mentions is how challenging it is to like do prompt engineering and managing prompt. So it was when I, when I found this repo, I was like, okay, so what are these tools that help you tackle prompt engineering doing? So, and, and I tried to break them down. And I think the, a lot of them uh, try to like give you less ambiguity. So like language models or like AI models are probabilistic by nature. So like it's very hard to like guarantee like what the output's gonna be. Uh, so like the input might change. So like of course you can set things like temperature equals zero, but um, for inputs that change just slightly, it can change the output very very significantly. And for a lot of applications, well that depends. Uh, on the certain format of the output. It's very hard to guarantee for that format. And OpenAI recently, at a dev day, announced a function calling to allow for, to make it a lot easier to like get the expected output structure for of the models. And a lot of the tools deal with, uh, for problem engineering, deal with like structure output. And also another category uh, problem that problem engineering is solving for is a memory management. So in a real world, like you might chat with a, a chatbot for a while, and how to make sure that how can you keep updating the memory of the chatbot so that it knows what you're talking about. And we see a lot of applications like that, um, not just of personal assistance, but also like in gaming, in education, and it's a very exciting area. So when we go into open source, right? Open source is just not open source. Like you quote a lot of open AI recently, like open source is nothing without its people. So there are a lot of like, I was wondering like, who are the people building on this amazing work that the today AI depends upon? So the first thing I thought about is like, okay, let's just try to break into this account. So on GitHub, for each account, we can see like whether the account is an organization or an, an individual user. So it's like, okay, so like, let's see like, what is the percentage of these repos are hosted by individual account versus organization account. And it's actually pretty surprising. So like a third of these repos, a third of the most popular repos on Gen AI, actually hosted by individual account. And of course, if you go through the different, uh, uh, different layers of stack, and you see that the lower the stack, the harder it is to, to build this by, by yourself. So origin noise, like, can I do this alone? But I realized when you do open source, right, you might start it, but you never really build it alone because it's going to be the whole community built with you. Um, I also going to see more, uh, here's a more the breakdown by subcategory. Um, so it's almost, you probably don't ever see any tool or like compute management, vector databases or data management built by individual, but um, for this category, usually you need a whole team uh, to do that with you. Um, and another thing I was curious about is just like, okay, so like comparing all the repos like hosted by individual contribute like individual users and organizations, what the that distribution is gonna be like. And it's surprising to me is that when I saw that like, oh, actually the repos hosted by users on average actually have more stars and more forks than the repos hosted by organizations. Of course, we all know that like the cow of stars is not the perfect metrics for impact, but I could think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, but then I tried to break it down by category. So it really depends on which category you are. So for Apply for most of the categories is actually um, repos hosted by organizations that have more stars and forks, except for like applications. It's, it seems like it makes sense because can be, you can see a lot of users spend a weekend build some really cool applications, um, and it can get very very popular, and then they can start like a company on, on top of it. So. When I was going through this, and that's some things that I was worried about, it's just like, sometimes like, I see that people when we contribute a repo, right? Like people really committed to their repo, like they start a repo and just want to like, work on it and they don't want to like, contribute to other. But that was not the case. When I went through the list of developers, so I was able to map out like 10,000 developers who contribute across 800 repos. And among them, I found just like, a quarter of them contribute to at least two repos. And you can see that a lot of them like, contribute to like, a lot, like 18 or like 15 or 10 repos. And when we're trying to plot this, and I found that like, I couldn't plot the distributions of repos, of like, the number of like, repos each person contribute to, because there's one outlier. There's one person who contributes to almost 300 repos. And I was just like, who is this person? Um, so I look at I look that person up, 
And that person actually contributes overall, like I think uh, over 2,000 as a repos, not just in Gen AI, right? And a lot of the repos are like smaller commit. First of all, like fixing the typos here and there. But I mean, like it's meaningful. And I think like what I, so I found it's very um, educational for me to went through this person's like all the contributions and see like, oh, there are a lot of cool, interesting tools that that person found and I didn't before. So I know this like, it just made me realize it's like how easy it is for us to get started and find repos and then make some changes to that work. Okay, so that is pretty much my work, uh, so like my talk. So um, I have the full list like of all the 800 repos here. If you want to like check it out more, um, I know there's like there are tongues that I missed. So if there's anything you want to add, um, please do. And I hope that you can find like on this list, you can find some repos that can make the work or the life in the future a bit easier. And so hope that they can also like. Um, motivate you to maybe in a start. If you haven't already, I know that we had a Lux Foundation event, so it probably already contributes to open source. But I just want to see, uh, say that like, it's very easy to get started and contribute to open source. And I could see that a lot of the very impactful repos we see today actually started by individuals and not organizations. So I hope that maybe if you haven't already, also start building something and share that with the community. Thank you very much.